Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guests today are Nick Ward, the Chief Information Security Officer at the Department of Justice. Gerald Karen III is the Chief Information Officer and Assistant Inspector General for Information Technology at the Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General. Don Watson is the Chief Information Security Officer for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. B.J. D'Souza, Director of Information Technology and Cybersecurity for the U.S. Government Accountability Office. And Matthew Marsden. He's the Vice President and Technical Account Management Leader for Federal at Tanium. Good to have you all with us today. And I want to start with what agencies are looking at with respect to their future, near immediate future, that could be a year, 18 months or so, with respect to the strategy for how people will be working and how the, especially the devices they use will be kind of set up and secured and so on, because I think the situation is very fluid. We don't know where the pandemic is going to rear its ugly head and whether we'll have this mass telework continue. So given that kind of fluid situation, why don't we start with you, Nick, from uh, DOJ? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, as you mentioned, it's definitely uh, a, continues to be a fluid situation. So and, and that's kind of going into our planning. And we envision a future that is likely going to be some sort of hybrid environment. Uh, there will definitely be people uh, working remotely more than ever before, um, before the pandemic, at least. Uh, we certainly have been able to adopt a very telework friendly environment over the past uh, couple of years now. And um, going forward, where some of the things and challenges that we're looking at is how do we actually continue this type of operation when we have part of our workforce in the office sitting in conference rooms and part of our office remote? And, you know, we we got really used to having face-to-face -face meetings before the pandemic. And then we got really used to having um, Teams meetings and video conferencing meetings during the pandemic. And that gets a little bit different when we start looking at people sitting in a room together and how do they, how does the audio work and things like that in a meeting when half the people aren't physically there and half the people are. So that's, that's one area. And then I guess like looking more from the device strategy and how to how do our employees connect to services is uh, that that's going to have to change and it has been changing um, things uh, you know, the executive order for cybersecurity has really driven us towards uh, a zero trust framework. And we have certainly embraced that idea. And so th this will help us actually pretty, it, it's, it's actually a very good framework for this hybrid type environment because it helps us look at devices and device security uh, with, without uh, regard to how the network operates. So it allows us to have secure devices. Uh, we, we're putting EDR on every every device. All those users connect into service based on their identities rather than the fact that they're sitting in a, in a particular office space. So that's some of the big things that we're looking at uh, going into the future. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to the OIG at HHS. Gerald, Karen, what's, uh, I guess you have to worry about the OIG itself, and also make sure that the emperor has clothes when you investigate what the rest of, of HHS is doing on their cybersecurity and device management. Well, I do the first part. I let the other, uh, the rest of the OIG do the other part. Uh, but um, for me, it's, yeah, I mean, Nick said it pr pretty similar for us, you know, it's uh, as everybody keeps terming the new normal. So we're anticipating, you know, supporting remote management as much as possible if we have to be ready for 100% telework at any time, I'm sure. Uh, but it, it's affecting us from space management, you know, uh, creating spaces for touchdown spaces because some people may not be in the office enough to uh, have a permanent space. So there's a lot of space management uh, issues as well that we're doing. So that, that of course rolls into what does IT need to provide as far as collaboration, BTC, locations, things like that. So a lot of planning is going on. Like you said at the beginning, uh, things are slipping. So uh, that gives us a little more time to plan, which is which is not a bad thing. Um, so we can be ready and, and get a little more details out. As far as devices, um, you know, as a CIO, you gotta, I got to um, balance the security as well as the performance uh, for the end user. So I am looking at different things of how they uh, access the you know a lot of a lot of the modernization is happening in the cloud and right now we have this what i call the boomerang effect where we uh 
VPN all the way back to an on-premise location just to boomerang back out to uh, the internet or the cloud location that they're going to. Um, but there's a lot of good things out there right now. And I think Tick 3.0 as well, which I would uh, consider part of your zero trust architecture gives a lot of flexibility now. So looking at taking advantage of that while still having the security, security telemetry, but of course, bringing better performance to the users rather than having to boomerang them around just to go um, to back out of the network to someplace. So that's something that we're looking at most definitely. As far as managing endpoint devices, um, there, there's different, when I, when I talk about zero trust, especially, you know, I look at different risk factors of that and every device, like I can put a lot of desktop agents on, on a device, but I can't necessarily do that on a mobile, the same telemetry on a mobile device. Um, I have to do other things. Um, then, you know, there's the concept of doing BYOD as well, um, where I'm managing applications potentially rather than the whole device. So we're looking at all those different factors. And as we develop our zero trust methodologies and our risk tolerances, we'll be measuring those factors and that will end up creating a threshold for our risk tolerances and what actions or what we allow them to do as they're accessing data on the network or the okay. location. All right. Thanks very much. Yeah. A complicated picture is definitely emerging. And uh, Don Watson for USPTO, of course, has a long history of mass telework on the part of the examiners that has extended to the headquarters staff now in, in recent uh, year and a half and so on. So what is the thinking about how this is going to work and and uh, examiners probably need more than just smartphones to do their work remotely. Yes, exactly, Tom. We've had a long history of having a robust telework program for our employees. And over the last three or four years, we've made significant IT improvements, um, helping with remote access and ac asset tracking and collaboration tools. So when we went to the COVID situation and everyone deployed for full remote telework, we did that very quickly and without disruption to our services when we had to close our physical offices. So we all know that remote users put great demand on traditional VPN-based access. Uh, we did have some challenges initially, but then we were able to, to um, correct those challenges and add additional capacity. But I think the challenge will be allowing distributed access for long-term while maintaining security detection, monitoring, and enforcement. We know that users will need to connect with the nearest points of presence, and we're looking at Secure Access Service Edge, which is a capability to deliver a single platform. It gives us that single pane of glass to see a company's end-to-end -end security. And as we look at that capability, it does support zero trust network access for secure remote access by distributing secure configurations to all devices, whether it's uh, mobile or, um, or other devices within you know, within our infrastructure. And so, you know, making sure that they're in place and they're unchanged before connecting and then monitoring both on network and off network endpoint behavior for continuous protection. So we're looking at the secure access service edge capabilities and really helping us um, with that in regards to remote access and giving our users access where and when they need it. All right, and I wanna to turn to Vijay D'Souza from GAO because you look at this across the government quite a bit. And what are the big challenges do you think agencies are going to have in the next period of time, the next fiscal year, let's say, with respect to supporting remote workers and their devices? Uh, thanks. Yeah, and I think the other three panelists really touched on a number of points that all make a lot of sense. And you know, we personally have experienced as well at GAO. Um, the security performance, um, and then also supporting the hybrid model. Um, I, I know I can speak from GAO's perspective that um, we were already a pretty high telework agency to begin with, but when we moved to almost full telework, it put a lot of stress on our collaboration tools, our video and audio conferencing. Um, so we had to actually bring in a lot of additional resources that way. I think you know we hadn't planned on those becoming the primary means of communication. Um, as folks move back into the office, I think Nick made a good point. Uh, you know, how do you support uh, a reasonable solution where some people are in a conference room and some people are, are remote and how can folks hear each other. Um, to your point about what agencies uh, are dealing with, we actually are planning to issue a report before the end of the year that looks at security practices at several agencies with respect to um, the shift towards, you know, high, a high telework model. Um, and, uh, you know, 
of course, uh, telework was not a new thing before. So a lot of the issues that we uh, were finding predate um, the sort of current pandemic issues. And do you find just uh, to follow up briefly that agencies, any agencies, are there agencies, I should say, that have BYOD policies or is it kind of mitigated towards government issued? No, I think it's a mix. I mean, um, a lot of agencies support both. You know, um, <laughs> I'd say from a security perspective, the challenge is, you know, the user wants what the user wants, right? So um, a lot of people like the convenience of having their own devices, but then you have other people who prefer the kind of a separation of having separate devices. Um, from a geo perspective, for a uh, desktop, for kind of traditional computing infrastructure, we do everything in a virtualized environment. So it makes it easier for us to support BYOD because things are pretty segmented. Um, and, uh, you know, we do see that some agencies can do that, some agencies can't because they have different um, infrastructure or computing needs. Um, so, sorry, so it, it kind of runs a range. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. And uh, Mr. Marsden from Tanium, I mean, the endpoint devices run the gamut. And you can tell which ones have BYOD when they go to conferences. They have two phones on the table in front of them instead of just one. That's kind of a clue as to who's doing what with respect to BYOD. But what do you see from your perspective as the challenge that agencies have from your perch looking across the government agencies? Thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. And I think all the rest of the panelists did a spectacular job at summarizing all the challenges that we see across all of the government and commercial agencies that we support. When 15, 16 months ago, when agencies that never previously considered telework went to a distributed workforce and the endpoint became the new perimeter, uh, most of those first few months were spent just trying to maintain mm -hmm. um, the fundamentals, right? Making sure that you could do hardware visibility and making sure that patching and vulnerability assessments took place. Many of the legacy tools stopped working or at best were, were operating in a degraded state. So agencies have done a spectacular job responding to that rapid transition. And now we're seeing uh, and supporting agencies in moving towards those IT modernization strategies and implementing new tools and new processes to really bring the telework and distributed workforce into the norm and being able to roll in, bring your own device management and perform all of those legacy software and hardware asset management and vulnerability and uh, configuration management processes really to bring those into, into the modern age. Yeah, so uh, you have to, I guess, maybe look at connectivity methodology or strategy and the device management and securing strategy as of a piece. Would that be a fair way to put it? Absolutely. One of the th biggest challenges that agencies have been facing is trying to support workers that are on disadvantaged networks. So uh, high latency, low bandwidth connectivity back to the corporate network has been a challenge. And so doing things like third-party application management and pushing large updates to operating systems has been problematic. And that's one area where we've seen a lot of focus in updating network components and in increasing throughput so that all of the distributed workers can, can get the access to services that they need. And Nick, let me ask you, of course, justice in the different components has always had a large field workforce and so on, and probably a lot of the headquarters staff, the same thing we saw at USPTO, they too now are field staff in the sense of working from home. And have you been thinking about getting around that whole VPN mass deployment to some other methodology for end user devices to connect? Because I'm presuming like a lot of agencies, you found that the large volumes of VPN may not be the most sustainable model or the most secure model for the, for the long term. Yeah, we, we have. We've actually um, been looking, and that's largely, uh, we've developed uh, a zero trust architecture and strategy. And that was one of the big drivers actually, is we've long contended with the fact that we have offices all over the country and um, you know those, those network circuits can, get pretty expensive and um, a lot of them complain that they don't have enough bandwidth. There's never enough bandwidth, right? And so just like we have situations where users are at home today and may not have good internet connectivity and we can't push patches easily, especially with all this network hairpinning uh, that some of the other um, panelists had mentioned is, uh, is zero trust architectures let us contend with that. We can 
we can allow things that look a lot like VPN split tunneling and which would be a forbidden word in cybersecurity just a year ago. Uh, but under a zero trust architecture, I can actually make that happen in a safe, secure way. Um, so that so that's some of the things that we're looking at to, to help contend with those bandwidth issues, reduce networking costs and um, and be able to get uh, patches and updates pushed out to users wherever they happen to be. And we'll follow up with the other agencies after the break. But before we do get to the break, Nick, a follow up there is what is your way of securing mobile devices, say for agents that have had them, for example, in the FBI for a long time uh, and many other pieces of, of uh, DOJ? How does that all how does that work? Yeah, so we're, we're looking at them. So you obviously can't apply the same sort of um, security that you can to a, a laptop, per se. Um, so what we're doing is, is we still want to get them onto our zero trust architecture so we know how those devices are communicating to the world. Um, we're looking at what are better ways that we can enforce um, updates to those devices to make sure that we understand. We've, we've long had things like uh, application security vetting on those mobile devices. And um, we don't, we are a very, we have a lot of different risk postures uh, at our different components. We have some components that have very public data type missions and we have some that are doing intelligence activities. So you can tell there's, there's different security postures. And so BYOD is not forbidden. Uh, but largely we're a, a, a government furnished type of organization. Most of our devices are provided by us, secured by us. Uh, but there are cases where BYOD might be allowed. And that BYOD, the device might be a, that you would allow would be a pen and a paper pad and a black binder. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Still use those. All right, we're going to take a break on that note and come back and keep uh, discussing this a little bit more in depth with some of the other speakers. My guests today are Nick Ward, the Chief Information Security Officer at the Department of Justice. Gerald Karen III is the Chief Information Officer and Assistant Inspector General for IT at the Office of Inspector General at Health and Human Services. Don Watson is the Chief Information Security Officer for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, B.J. D'Souza, Director of Information Technology and Cybersecurity for the U.S. Government Accountability Office, and Matthew Marsden, Vice President and Technical Account Management Team Leader for Federal at Tanium. I'm your moderator, Tom Temin. This panel discussion is Zero Trust in the Era of Endpoints, sponsored by Tanium here on Federal News Network. <laughs> 